The Autobiography of Benjamin Franklin, Chapter 18. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Benjamin Franklin, edited by Frank Woodworth Pine. Chapter 18. Scientific Experiments. Before I proceed in relating the part I had in public affairs under the new governor's administration, it may not be amiss here to give some account of the rise and progress of my philosophical reputation. In 1746, being at Boston, I met there with a Dr. Spence, who was lately arrived from Scotland, and showed me some electric experiments. They were imperfectly performed, as he was not very expert but being on a subject quite new to me, they equally surprised and pleased me. Soon after my return to Philadelphia, our library company received from Mr. P. Collinson, Fellow of the Royal Society of London, a present of a glass tube with some account of the use of it in making such experiments. I eagerly seized the opportunity of repeating what I had seen at Boston, and by such practice acquired great readiness in performing those also which we had an account of from england adding a number of new ones i say much practice for my house was continually full for some time with people who came to see these new wonders begin footnote the royal society of london for improving natural knowledge was founded in sixteen sixty and holds the foremost place among english societies for the advancement of science End footnote. To divide a little this encumbrance among my friends, I caused a number of similar tubes to be blown at our glass house, with which they furnished themselves, so that we had at length several performers. Among these the principal was Mr. Kennesley, an ingenious neighbor, who, being out of business, I encouraged to undertake showing the experiments for money, and drew up for him two lectures, in which the experiments were ranged in such order, and accompanied with such explanations, in such method, as the foregoing should assist in comprehending the following. He procured an elegant apparatus for the purpose, in which all the little machines that I had roughly made for myself were nicely formed by instrument-makers. His lectures were well attended, and gave great satisfaction, and after some time he went through the colonies, exhibiting them in every capital town, and picked up some money. In the West Indies, indeed, it was with difficulty the experiments could be made from the general moisture of the air. Obliged as we were to Mr. Collinson for his present of the tube, etc., I thought it right he should be informed of our success in using it, and wrote him several letters containing accounts of our experiments. He got them read at the Royal Society, where they were not at first thought worth so much notice as to be printed in their transactions. One paper, which I wrote for Mr. Kennesley, on the sameness of lightning with electricity, I sent to Dr. Mitchell, an acquaintance of mine, and one of the members also of that society, who wrote me word that it had been read, but was laughed at by the connoisseurs. The papers, however, being shown to Dr. Fothergill, he thought them of too much value to be stifled, and advised the printing of them. Mr. Collinson then gave them to Cave for publication in his gentleman's magazine, but he chose to print them separately in a pamphlet, and Dr. Fothergill wrote the preface. Cave, it seems, judged rightly for his profit, for by the additions that arrived afterwards, they swelled to a quattro volume, which has had five editions and cost him nothing for copy money. It was, however, some time before those papers were much taken notice of in England, a copy of them happening to fall into the hands of the Count de Buffon, a philosopher deservedly of great reputation in France, and indeed all over Europe. He prevailed with M. de la Barde to translate them into French, and they were printed at Paris. The publication offended the Abbe Nollet, preceptor of the natural philosophy to the royal family, and an able experimenter, who had formed and published a theory of electricity, which then had the general vogue. He could not at first believe that such a work came from America, and said it must have been fabricated by his enemies at Paris to decry his system. Afterwards, having been assured that there really existed such a person as Franklin at Philadelphia, which he had doubted, 
he wrote and published a volume of letters chiefly addressed to me defending his theory and denying the verity of my experiments and of the position deduced from them i once proposed answering the abbey and actually began the answer but on consideration that my writings contained a description of experiments which any one might repeat and verify and if not to be verified it could not be defeated or of observations offered as conjectures and not delivered dogmatically therefore not laying me under any obligation to defend them and reflecting that a dispute between two persons writing in different languages might be lengthened greatly by mistranslations and thence misconceptions of one another's meaning much of one of the abbey's letters being founded on an error in the translation i concluded to let my papers shift for themselves believing it was better to spend what time i could spare from public business in making new experiments than in disputing about those already made i therefore never answered m nolet and the event gave me no cause to repeat my silence for my friend m leroy of the royal academy of sciences took up my cause and refuted him my book was translated into italian german and latin languages and the doctrine it contained was by degrees universally adopted by the philosophers of europe in preference to that of the abbey so that he lived to see himself the last of his sect except m b of paris his immediate disciple what gave my book the more sudden and general celebrity was the success of one of its proposed experiments made by Messieurs Delabard and Delor at Marley for drawing lightning from the clouds. This engaged the public attention everywhere. M. Delor, who had an apparatus for experimental philosophy and lectured at the branch of science, undertook to repeat what he called the Philadelphia experiments, and after they were performed before the king and court, all the curious of Paris flocked to see them. I will not swell this narrative with an account of that capital experiment, nor of the infinite pleasure I received in the process of a similar one I made soon after with a kite at Philadelphia, as both are to be found in the histories of electricity. Dr. Wright, an English physician, when at Paris, wrote to a friend who was of the Royal Society an account of the high esteem my experiments were in among the learned abroad and of their wonder that my writings had been so little noticed in england the society on this resumed the consideration of the letters that had been read to them and the celebrated dr watson drew up a summary account of them and of all i had afterwards sent to england on the subject which he accompanied with some praise of the writer this summary was then printed in the transactions and some members of the society in london particularly the very ingenious Mr. Canton, having verified the experiment of producing lightning from the clouds by a pointed rod, had acquainted them with the success. They soon made me more than amends for the slight with which they had before treated me. Without my having made any application for that honour, they chose me a member, and voted that I should be excused the customary payments, which would have amounted to twenty-five guineas, and ever since have given me their transactions gratis they also presented me with the gold medal of sir godfrey copley for the year seventeen fifty three the delivery of which was accompanied by a very handsome speech of the president lord macclefield where i was highly honoured begin footnote sir godfrey copley an english baronet died in seventeen o nine donator of a fund of one hundred pounds in trust for the royal society of london for improving natural knowledge End footnote end of chapter eighteen